The first pair of board games I'm talking about today are a comparison between David and Goliath. The first game is designed by a world-famous board game designer, and if Board Game Geek is any judge of greatness, this designer has six games in the BGG Top 100. The second designer, as wonderful and as experienced as he is, is far less known and has no games in the BGG Top 100. But if you've been watching this channel for long at all, I don't even have to tell you that the BGG Top 100 doesn't carry much weight for me. In fact, one of the things that gets me most excited is sharing a comparison between a highly overrated game and a game that I think deserves much more attention. And in fact, that first game is a game that I recently played and discovered that I did not like it all. So I have a scathing review for you and a very exciting review about a game that I bet you've never even heard of before. Plus, I've got two more pairs to talk about in today's video, which I'll be sharing games to avoid and games to buy with an emphasis on complex board games. Hi, my name is Ben, and earlier in February, I released three games to avoid and three games to play instead, but that had a focus on family-style board games. And when I say family, I'm talking about board games that you can play with your kids. So many of my criticisms of so-called family games was that they were too complex, but I don't at all intend for that to mean that I don't like complex games. In fact, quite the opposite. I love complex games. I don't play them with my kids, of course, but Today, I want to do another video, this time with an emphasis on complex board games, the ones that I think are overrated and the ones that I think more people should hear about. Now, what does it take to make a great complex board game? Well, we'll soon find out. Let's start with that comparison between the two games I mentioned in the introduction. That first game is A Feast for Odin, designed by Uwe Rosenberg. So what's my problem with this game? A game which, by the way, is number 22 on Board Game Arena, a game that many people like. Uh, some people love this game. I can't stand this game. So what's the problem with the game? Well, first of all, I feel like this game is very inconsistent with Rosenberg's designs. For one thing, the game introduces dice, which is just so grinds against my expectation for like a Euro game with tile placing and worker placement and so many other things going on that, that they would use dice and a press your luck element by the way. Not just rolling dice and seeing what happened but like oh take a chance and maybe I can roll again. I got a 12 sided die and maybe if I do it on the third time I'll get a better number. Like so frustrated by that. But uh, that is not even my number one complaint. Experimenting with new mechanics, okay, fine, badly done, but you can experiment with new mechanics. The problem with the game is it is this sprawling mess of just all the options. Just everything. Every game that he's ever designed just designed into one game. You've got poly polyomino placement, you've got worker placement, you've got resources, you've got exploration, you've got you've got animals that are reproducing. It just has everything. And oh man, one of my favorite games, one of my favorite games of all time is Agricola. This beautiful worker placement game that just gets increasingly complex as more and more actions are revealed during the course of the game and, and gets more and more rich decision making. But in Feast for Odin, you just get everything, just all at once, just vomited onto the table. Here's all the pieces, here's all the actions, ha have at it. There, there's nothing containing this game. Now, okay, okay, I, you know what? I'm already so excited. Why would you like this game? You know why you would like this game? You would like this game if you just wanted unlimited options. This is like the sandbox of board games. I just want all the things. And you know what else I want to do? I never want to pay for workers. I just want the workers to come to me automatically like Everdell. Just, just keep bringing them in. I just want the game to get longer and longer as I play. I want games that feel like they'll never end. That's the perfect game for me. Ha! Ha! Okay, I might be getting a little too excited. 
Let's slow down and back it up and talk about how you play. So, in A Feast for Odin, uh, players take turns placing their Vikings on an action space. And the actions are very, very numerous. And there are one, two, three, and four Viking numbered spaces. And each of those actions can do, like I said earlier, all of the things that a Viking could ever do and more. Um, and you block other opponents by taking certain actions and upgrading your tiles so you can place them on either your main player board or other boards that you might gain during the course of the game by exploring, just having lots of tiles to place on things. So uh, this would be a game that would be very exciting to people who love punching out cardboard. There's just tons and tons of pieces. Now, none of the pieces make any sense at all. Uh, let's see, if you have milk, milk turns into, gosh, what was it? Milk turns, like, cows turn into sweaters, which is cool, but then sweaters turn into armor because that's fine, I guess. Fish turns into, like, a plant or something. Like, the, 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 the upgrade board is just so nonsensical. And then you've got certain trophies that you can get from pillaging that you can go onto your board, but there are certain rules, like, this kind of treasure can't go on the board. It's like, it's like non-perishable goods only can go onto your board, but if it's a red good or a orange good, then that's a good you have to eat. There's, there's just an excess of unnecessary complexity. I should probably not be elected as a candidate to do a tutorial on how to play this game. I can't even talk about how to play it without hating it. So, let's go to the next piece, which is what should you play instead? Ah, yes, the David game. The designer who less people know about. So I didn't had, had really think about this, by the way. I wanted to capture something that does the, the mechanics and the complexity of A Feast for Odin. I wanted to pick a game that really captures that essence, but is not boring or horrible. I wanted to find a game that is complex and very strategic. And I gotta say, having calmed down a little bit, there is a lot of there's a lot of thinking about a feast for Odin. I should go back. I'll say um, another reason you might like this game. If I'm if I'm trying to be very fair here, is it's a game that encourages you to find a contingency plan. You can make certain plans, but it is possible that other players will interfere. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, sometimes you can really work towards getting things to work together nicely, and I do see how that can be satisfying. So. There's that. That can be very satisfying. Anyway, I wanted another game that captures that, that satisfaction from making everything work out. But I wanted a game that thematically mattered, that felt motivated, and that felt tight. A game where you couldn't just do everything, but a game where you had to really think about what your opponents were doing, and you had to plan a little bit more carefully. Things just shouldn't be available all the time, especially from the onset. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, like I, the, the perfect game, this game is so great. It's also one to four players. It even has tile placing and you have your own board and you have interference with like, it's much more competitive. The game is called Small City. And the design, I have to look at the designer's name. Al, Albin Vyard, he's done other like really interesting thematic games. Small City is a game I never would have played because it's called Small City. And Lord knows I've played so many Build-A-City games that one more, especially one called Small City, I was like, no, that's just going to be some cute little game. It is not a cute little game. This is a very complex game. So if I was to overlay my ratings for this game on top of A Feast for Odin, we would see it exceeds Feast for Odin in complexity. It exceeds it even in strategy. I give a perfect 10 for this game and strategy. There's so much going on here. But then because the gameplay is much more motivated and much more clear, I think that it improves the mechanics and thematically it's almost off the charts. Like this game is so richly thematic. What's happening is you're building a city, but unlike so many other city building games, um, in this city, you've got a few things going on. One, buildings upgrade based on 
how they're placed next to each other. And as they upgrade, they become larger, which can create more connections and cause chain reactions so that buildings can uh, kind of upgrade automatically. Planning that out is extremely satisfying. And again, it's polyomino pieces, just like A Feast for Odin. But then there's another aspect going on, which is that in order to, you know, really gain some momentum building your city, you have to have industry. And that in industry generates pollution, and then the pollution kills citizens. And that has an impact on everyone's score. So there's a lot of competition. And then what I think is actually very fascinating is whichever player produced the most pollution each round is the player whose citizen dies. So there's a lot of uh, player interaction. It's a much more competitive game, um, but in general, I'm just almost in awe by how thematically motivated it is. It is very complex. I cannot do an entire rule overview, but if you want to take a look at it, be on the lookout because this summer the deluxe version is being released. And so I personally don't own my own copy yet. I'm going to wait for that. <sighs> on to the next pair of games. So the next overrated game is a game that has reached the popularity level of being on the bookshelves of Barnes and Noble. The game is it's decent. I've got to say, this is not something I'm going to like go off the rails about how what an injustice to humanity it is that this game exists. Uh, but, you know, I've got a better alternative, I think. My game might be a little bit overrated. Uh, the game is Lost Ruins of Arnak. You've probably heard of it. So, what I like about Lost Ruins of Arnak, this is a deck builder worker placement game. In order to place workers, you use cards from your deck in order to gain resources uh, so that you can take the most effective actions. I really like the way that it feels to try to optimize your turn. You know, you've got several options, several cards that you can play, several different choices you can make. You can buy a card, you can do the research track, which will give you free resources, and then you've got these uh, idle tokens, cards, tiles, idle tiles that you can place on your player mat in order to get one-time benefits, but that comes at a cost of some victory points, so you have to weigh some good decisions here. The problem with Lost Ruins of Arnak is that the game just, you kind of feel ambivalent about all of the actions. It's like, oh, it, and that, and it doesn't really have a meaning. The turns aren't very interesting. You've got coins and compasses and tablets and arrowheads and like gems, but it they don't really mean anything. You may as well have just had A's and B's and C's and D's and E's. Like you're trading things. Okay, I can trade a B for an. Uh, I can trade a B for a D. That's such an exciting card. But mm, you play it, and it's thought provoking, but not not interesting. Okay, that's that. Like that's my whole problem with it. That's all I'm gonna say. Otherwise, it's fine. Thoughtful game. Better alternative. Dune Imperium. Dune Imperium, now listen, I hardly ever play IP games, intellectual property games. I'm not a big fan of games that are, you know, follow movies or books, but when I find a good game, if a good game is good, it's good. I, I'm not a fan of Dune necessarily, but man, the game is well done. So, I compare the two because Dune Imperium is a worker placement deck builder game, much the same way. When you want to place a worker, this is slightly different from Ruins of Arnak, uh, you can't place a worker anywhere unless you discard a card. But at the end of the round, the cards that you keep are cards that you can use to purchase more cards. So you have to make this decision making, like, do I want to discard this card in order to take the action, or do I want to hold this card so that I can uh, have the effects at the end of the round? That's excellent. Um, you know, Lost Ruins of Arnak has a research track. This one has influence tracks, and so you're influencing different houses in the world of Dune. Um, there's also competition. There's uh, battles, and I love, I'm so glad they didn't include dice. It's just dude for dude. You're putting soldiers on the scene, and they fight each other, and the one who places the most wins. Uh, really simple battle, but enough tension there. You've got event cards that are coming out. Now, if I had any criticisms of Dune Imperium at all, 
I think there's a little bit too much luck going on. I was not a big fan of the intrigue cards. Um, I, you know, playing the game, some people just got awesome intrigue cards that gave them extra points at the end of the game. And you can get victory po or intrigue cards that don't give you points that might give you an action, but I feel like there's imbalance in what can come out and there's nothing you can do about that. It's not even draw two, take one. It's just draw one and hopefully it's great. But I will say that if this idea of a uh, deck builder worker placement game is interesting to you, if you'd like to play a game like that, I think that Dune was much more motivated and more fun to play. There was more player interaction than there was with Lost Ruins of Arnak. And then lastly, uh, the last game I want to share with you is a game that I played, I thought was awesome. And I've kind of been searching for the right video to share this game. Um, because I do a lot of games about family board games, I haven't really had the chance. This is a very complex game, the one I'm about to share with you. So I thought, well, how can I tie this in? I went on to Board Game Geek, and man, oh, I found the perfect comparison. This game, it came out a few years ago. Um, Great Western Trail. I played it. It's so lackluster, but it has been in the top 10 on Board Game Geek for years. I... Ah, what do people see in this game? Now, is it horrible? No, it's 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 a fun game. It's a fun game. But it's just so like point salad. Just lots of you got your you got your cows, you're trying to get the best hand of cows. So there's a little bit of a deck builder again, and you're trying to optimize it by using these actions, but you need a train, and then to get the train you have to upgrade the stations, and then you get points for this, and points for that, and points for objectives, and da 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 points, 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 and so blah, blah. Now, the thing is, that doesn't mean it's bad. I like, you know, another game I like? Russian Railroads. Russian Railroads is, is cool. Like, it's kind of meaningless. There's point salad going on in that game, but I really like it. There's nothing wrong with it. The problem with the game isn't that, isn't that it's point salad. It's, why is it in the top ten? Why is it in the top ten? Feel like I'm doing it an injustice. Like I'm making a comparison video and I'm making it sound worse than it is. It's it's not a bad game, okay? It's just so not worth the reputation it has. Great Western Trail. <clears throat> Better alternative. See? This is what it's all about. I want to share games that people haven't even heard of before. The better alternative is Lignum. Now, Lignum. I'm going to show you, I haven't even shown you the picture of the game yet. Dude, it looks so lame. Like, the cover of the game is so lame. You ready for it? Lignum. What's the problem with Lignum? It's a game about chopping wood. You play all these games where wood is a resource. This one, the whole game, the victory points themselves are wood. Well, it's money, actually, but it's a game about wood. But, man, the game is... If you're here, I'm assuming you're watching this video because you want complex, strategic board games. This game is off the charts. There is so much going on. What do the games have in common? So, Great Western Trail and Lignum both have a very similar mechanic where you are, call it a mover, or sorry, call it a worker movement game. So both games, you have a worker that you're moving along a trail, and as the worker gets to different sites along the trail, they can perform actions. Now, the difference is in Great Western Trail, the distance you're allowed to move is limited. So you can move like, you know, four spots or something. And in Lignum, you can move as far as you want. Like, um, oh man, what's the Japanese game that, uh, I can't think of its name, but you can move as far as you want, and then after you move that far, Players who are behind you can make stops along the way and pick up the things that you passed. But the game is heavily dependent on planning. You've got to plan out everything. They even have a planning action where you can get a bonus if you plan for future rounds. Um, this is a very competitive, thoughtful game with a lot going on, but very clear gameplay. Unlike Great Western Trail, you're just going to make like a ton of points and who knows, 
points, 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 points. In lignum, you know exactly what you need to do. And you're thinking, okay, I need to get this kind of wood, and it needs to get to this stage, and I need to get this kind of saw sawyer, and I need to get this person to bring the wood down the river. Da, da, da. Okay, so how am I gonna make that do? Oh, okay, take, and then by turn two, I can do this, and then by turn three, I can do this, and oh, got it. Okay, I'm gonna figure it out. Got it. But then, once you've made your entire plan, you have to depend. Well, you know, you have to be strategic so that your opponents don't take the spaces that you need. So you're, you're trying to jump ahead. You see stuff that you want. And you're like, oh, it'd be so nice. But I can't let my opponents take that action because it need I need it for the plan. So you end up passing actions by in order to uh, get something for your plan and then your opponents take it. So you've got to pay attention to what they're doing too. Sometimes you can play offensively in the um, getting other people's plans. Like, aha, uh -huh, clearly they want to do that. I'm going to, if they don't, if they're not careful, I'm going to steal that action from them. So the game feels like you are trying to outsmart your opponents. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I think it's definitely worth considering. Deserves to be in the top 10 as long as you can handle the complexity, right? But I said that from the onset. All these games are complex. Those are my three newest games to avoid and games that you should play instead complexity style. Hope you like this video. If you want to check out some family videos, go ahead and check out the same video series, but with a family focus. And uh, hope you enjoyed this. I hope it wasn't like obnoxiously hard on a feast for Odin. But yeah, you know what? I get excited about games. It's like what I do. I mean, I have a YouTube. I, I'm I'm doing it. What else am I going to do with my life, right? Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye.